Hello, this is Mr. Archibald, and welcome back to AP U.S. History. We're, today we're going to talk about the colonial economy and salutary neglect. We're going to start, of course, with mercantilism. We've mentioned it before. Um, just a refresher, it's the economic system that was dominant during the 16 and 1700s. It was all about strong governmental control, and it was about focusing the wealth of the whole system into the mother country. Wealth was seen as finite, there was only so much of the pie. The point was to get as much of it as possible, to attain as much gold as possible. So, as this image illustrates, the gold would come from the colonies into the mother country, and exports would be maximized by raising the imports, uh, the tariffs on imports, limiting the amount of stuff that comes in, maximizing the amount of goods that come out, and, and uh, vice versa, the amount of gold would flow, gold and silver would flow into the country. In this system, of course, the colony's role would be to, as a source of raw materials, providing the goods, uh, the raw materials for the mother, mother country to manufacture. Uh, the idea is to export more than import. This raises your supply of gold. Of course, Britain enforced the mercantilism in a series of navigation acts, uh, basically requiring the colonies to trade with them as much as possible. Uh, in fact, uh, they made it uh, pretty much illegal for the colonies to trade with any other country. They had uh, high taxes on non-British goods and encouraged uh, them to produce cash crops and raw materials and they discouraged the colonies from actively developing their own manufacturing. Now that didn't stop the colonies so much, but it did have a slowing down uh, of that effect. And then of course they're serious about it until they're not. Under weaker monarchs there was more focus on the economic development of England rather than the colonies. And so under William and Mary, King George I, King George II, basically the time periods from uh, leading up to about 1760, the colonists were able to get around a lot of these things, largely because they weren't really enforced. So they ignored um, the laws that limited their importing of foreign goods, or if they were caught, they were put on trial in front of uh, colonial peers, which promptly let them off the hook through jury nullification, because why would you find somebody guilty for importing cheaper goods for you to buy? Sure. It's illegal, but it's helping you stretch your dollar further. Many colonists saw this as a permanent reality, not a temporary phase, and so they got quite used to the salutary neglect, and it lasted for 46 years or so, uh, from 1714 to 1760. So because it was such a long time, they got used to it, and they uh, saw it as permanent. The, this map here uh, shows the development of the English uh, colonies by 1689. You see that they are often hugging the coast. And I have a question here. Why do you think the colonists did that? Why did they? Why was there so much development along the coast? Let me know in the uh, private comments on Google Classroom. Um, another little interesting thing. Does, how much does geography determine the economy of the colonies? I'm going to introduce you to a term that you may or may not know, the fall line. The fall line is a geographical point where the elevation falls rapidly as the mountains give way to the coastal plain leading to the ocean. It's also the place where water falls rapidly downhill. Well, you will see a lot of falls. In the south, as this map here shows, the fall line is very far from the coast, sometimes hundreds of miles from the coast. but in the north, the fall line runs really close to the coastline. And I have a couple questions here, and I'd like for you to answer these in the Google chat as well. Um, what advantages do you think this gives the south, and what advantages do you think this gives the north? Obviously, the advantages that it gives the south are different than the advantages that it gives it to the north. So a fall line far back gives these colonies certain advantages and a fall line really close gives colonies these colonies certain advantages I'd like to be very interested to see if you know what those are and I'll be looking for your comments in the Google Classroom quotes so to sum it up the colonies of the New England the economies of the colonies 
pretty much boiled down with this. New England focusing on shipping, fishing, shipbuilding, trade, lumber, basic manufacturing. The middle colonies, shipping, and then lots of foodstuffs and trade and grains. The southern colonies focusing on cash crops, tobacco, rice, indigo, some wheat, some lumber, some furs. That is the general breakdown of the economy of the American colonies. But it wasn't all where it ends. Of course, we got to talk about the triangle trade. The triangle trade is the trade that developed around slavery, where the uh, colonies would send rum, iron, gunpowder, cloth, tools to Africa, pick up slaves, bring them to the Indies, and then they would also bring slaves to the 13 colonies along with molasses, sugar, etc. And so there's multiple different versions of the triangle trade here uh, and all of them involved or most of them involve slavery as what they call the middle passage or the part that's in at, that's the third uh, this the second of the three trade routes. Now the slave trade was not just a southern problem. Too often we limit the focus of slavery uh, to the big bad people in the South, but that's not the case. See, the slavery was a entirely, I mean, it involved the entirety of the colonies. It involved the shipbuilding, the port building, the sail makers, the rope makers, the timber industry, anybody who built anything or put anything that went on a ship that was involved in the slave trade. It involved insurance industries in the North who insured slave cargo. It involved the refiners of tobacco and sugar as they were used to trade for the slaves in Africa. It involved distillers, rough rum makers. It involved textiles, guns, iron products. And it also involved Africans of noble birth who used their militaries to enslave their enemies and sell them to the Europeans. But most fundamentally, it involved anyone who purchased tobacco, cotton, rice, indigo, or anything else made with slave labor. <clears throat> Too often we focus on the Southerners as being the prime mover of the slave trade, and it really wasn't because, in my opinion, demand is what drives economies. If there was not any demand for slave products, then there would not be a demand for slave labor. So plain and simple, every single person in the colonies and outside the colonies had a hand in making slavery a real problem, not just a southern problem. This here map shows the, where the slaves came from, largely from the uh, Ivory and Gold Coast and the Congo region. Uh, millions of people displaced, many of them going to South America, the Indies, and the British colonies in North America. <clears throat> this shows you the breakdown of the royal, proprietary, and corporate uh, colonies in the United States, the um, amount of income that was generally received by most, you'll see that the West Indian islands had a much higher per capita, um, exports per capita per white individual. Uh, the southern had um, about 40 shillings and the northern mainland about 15 shillings. Um, Finally, I want to talk about slave resistance. There were multiple ways that the slaves resisted slavery. Okay, these individuals resisted slavery by developing their own community and culture, by having their own language. This is the Gullah culture in the uh, in the area, rice growing area of South Carolina, predominantly. Also, there were methods of path passive resistance, such as slowing work or breaking tools or doing these kinds of things to passively resist the affirmation of, the, of that you are, are owned by someone slowly basically keeping your mental sanity telling telling yourself telling others I don't I'm not I am my own individual I don't belong to someone else and you know I'm gonna break this hoe or I'm gonna not work when he tells me to work um, whatever running away obviously one wouldn't be that big until the development I mean it was always big. Everyone, every slave wanted to run away, but there were lots of barriers to slaves running away. The Underground Railroad development in the 1800s helped improve those odds, but not a whole lot, especially in the Deep South. There was a lot of um, barriers to being able to run away uh, from a plantation. 
But the one we're going to talk about today, the violent resistance, specifically the Stone Revolt in 1937, or uh, 17, <laughs> sorry, 1739. The Stone Revolt was one of the most significant slave revolts in the South. It um, happened in South Carolina, September 9th, 1739. It was the largest revolt up to that time, killed about 60 people. And as a result, and this is where I want to focus on, what were the outcomes? Obviously, it wasn't a successful slave revolt. There was only one successful slave revolt in the Western Hemisphere, and that was the uh, one on the island nation of Haiti. But there were many that were attempted, even though they were not successful, even though they knew the, law, the odds were long. But what happened as a result? South Carolina passed several laws because of this revolt that fundamentally changed the ways that slaves and their owners um, operated. They passed laws limiting or almost prohibiting manumission or the freeing of slave people. Uh, the passed laws prohibiting slaves from growing their own food, assembling in large groups, earning money, or learning to read. They worked on improving conditions in slavery in order to avoid these problems that helped spawn the uh, Stonewall Revolt or the Rebellion. And they passed laws requiring at least one white to every ten blacks on a plantation. So they passed a, a law that basically limited the number of slaves a plantation could have um, was, or, or made sure that that number was dependent on the number of whites. Um, focused on developing an enslaved population that was native born. And this is key right here. They banned the slave trade, the international slave trade, for over, uh, for over a decade. And the purpose of that was to develop a a population of slaves that were that had always been enslaved that this population was seen as less likely to revolt because they had known nothing else part of the problem in the Stone Rebellion is that they had imported slaves from the Congo region that were both Catholic they were Christian and who had known freedom they had been free before so they knew what they were were losing what they were missing uh, here are a few slides showing the the basics of the Stono Rebellion uh, on the site where the Stono Rebellion began in South Carolina near Charleston. And just a few final examples of the slave code. This is what it would be what would be used by a slave if they were to be off the property. So they were they were going to be allowed to leave the property, but only if they had a sheet of paper signed by their owner telling them when they could leave, where, where could they could go, etc. Um, in the slave code of 1740, passed the year after the Stono uh, Rebellion, uh, here it talks about how uh, an individual who does not have the authority to do so cannot beat or bruise or maim a slave. Uh, and if they do so, then they will have to pay the sum of 40 shillings current money over besides the damages here and after mentioned to the use of the poor that that parish which some shall of commence shall be committed. So they'll have to pay for damages plus a $40 fine to the local poorhouse to help out the local poor. But it's also important to notice that while we are doing our best to help the slaves out, uh, to keep them from getting you know overworked, etc., there is still a very distinct line between slave and slave owner and if a slave resists his master and is killed in the process then it shall, it'll be as if such accident had never happened there that's the cold hard facts of of slavery that oftentimes people say uh, about slavery that slaves are good i mean hey it's an investment why would you want to damage your investment but the reality is you're a piece of property and if you break a piece of property, no matter how expensive it is, there are no consequences for you. It's your property to do with as you wish. And so this often, um, this dehumanizing aspect was one of the most terrible aspects of slavery and continues to be the, uh, one of the terrible aspects of slavery. And that's all I have. Have a great day. See you soon.